Mr Brereton said he would not be making any apologies for the hard line he has taken at the dockyard, even though his actions yesterday prompted a bitter and public attack Practices from his federal Labor colleague, Alan Morris. We make no apologies for what we've done. We've done it because we've had to do it. And it's the only way that we can save the, the 180 jobs that can remain at the dock. Are you concerned that a fellow ALP member and a federal member at that has attacked you in this way? I don't get involved in slanging matches with the members of other members of parliament. My job is to try and save 180 jobs at the state dock and they'll all be lost unless the government embarks upon this program of restructuring the dockyard based upon the recommendations of the Oaks report. We make no apology to Mr Morris or anyone else for that. Well, Mr Morris says your actions show a lack of interest in the dockyard itself and an absolute disregard for the damage you are doing to Newcastle. What's your reaction to I that? I don't get involved in slanging matches with Mr Morris but surely or it must else. concern you. No, I won't get involved in slanging matches with him. The government is doing what it must do, and that is try and save 180 jobs. If we can't implement the recommendations of the Oaks report, then all of the jobs at the dockyard will be lost because it will certainly close. Mr Brereton said there was also no question of Premier Unsworth's support. Oh, I don't speculate about that. The government is resolute in this matter. You're resolute on this matter. The government is resolute on this matter, and it must be if we are to save the jobs. Otherwise, the whole dock will close. Mr Brereton also did some blasting of his own today when construction got underway on a new $15.8 million tunnel at Boomerang Creek. At a conference amongst the trees at the construction site, Mr Brereton said the contract had been let to Coya Construction Limited, a privately owned Queensland-based company. He said the contract had gone outside New South Wales because the Queensland company had submitted the best and most cost-efficient tender. Mr Brereton detonated the first explosive charges, launching the three-year project. The 11-kilometre tunnel will link Mangrove Creek Dam to the Wyong River to provide a more reliable water supply and greater protection during periods of drought. Ridgewan's foundry in Lake Road just before 9 o'clock last night. The tin shed was an inferno by the time firemen arrived. The timber patterns and moulds were well lighted. The gas company was called in when a gas line ignited, shooting flames into the night sky. It took firemen an hour to bring the fire under control, but by that time, the shed and its contents were destroyed. By the light of day, it was evident what a good job firemen had done. They'd been able to contain the blaze to the pattern house. Damage has been estimated at between $150,000 and $200,000, but the property is insured. Police have been investigating the cause of the fire, but have few clues at this stage. Early theories are that it was an electrical fault. Over, over the matter, what's your reaction to that? Oh, I don't get involved. In The rubber duck was donated to the Surf Life Saving Club by local businessman Frank Fresca. He was called upon to christen the boat before handing it over to club official Richard Townsend. The $5,000 inflatable rubber boat will be used to patrol the beach and assist swimmers in difficulties. The club's 170 active members consider it a valuable addition to their stock of rescue equipment and this morning took time out to put it through its paces. Sodium hypochlorate is a pale yellow liquid with the smell of chlorine. If exposed to fire or other acids, a deadly chlorine gas is given off. And that's a situation that fire units, police, ambulance and all rescue squads wanted to avoid. The truck was travelling north along the Pacific Highway, about 13 kilometres from Bulladilla, through the area known as the Gap, when the driver noticed flames from the rear end of the cabin. All emergency units were called in when most of the toxic chemicals spilt out onto the highway. The area was evacuated and traffic was banked up on both sides as firemen diluted the substance with water and foam. Dangerous fumes were released and all emergency personnel were forced to wear protective clothing and breathing equipment. 
The problem was intensified when it was discovered that other chemicals, including sodium metobisulfate used as a sterilising solution, were also on board. It wasn't until four hours later that the all clear was given for the truck to be towed away to a nearby clearing, allowing the highway to be reopened. Mrs Sinclair's first port of call was St Joseph's High School at Lochinvar. The wife of the beleaguered National Party leader showed none of the strain of the past few weeks' political shake-up. She spoke to students from the high school and St Patrick's Primary and Infant School on subjects ranging from deportment and grooming to the sexual abuse of children. But community issues aside, Rosemary Sinclair was in town to rally the party faithful. She says she is unperturbed by the latest coalition crisis and she does not believe Sir Joe Bielke peterson poses a threat to Ian Sinclair's leadership. There is a Queensland Premier who is in Queensland who has little to do. He says he has but he cannot decide the leadership of the Federal National Party. But Sir Joe has made no secret of the fact that he wants to be in Canberra and the National Party is the obvious vehicle. It would be very advantageous to have Joe's assistance. He does seem to have a large following and he's seen as having done a good job in Queensland so it would be very nice to have his assistance and I know that's what Ian's working for. Do you think you could give your counterpart Lady Flo a run for her money? I'm not interested in running for the Senate because um, I'm, I'm very happy to support Ian. I'm very supportive in, in his of his role. And, but apart from that, I like to be able to choose when I'm going to spend time with my family. Mrs Sinclair concludes her visit to the Hunter this evening with a combined meeting of Rotary Clubs at the Sulphide Corporation. There are more than 40 breeds of sheep in Australia and as many different types of wool. The Newcastle Technical College has the largest collection of sheep's clothing in the country and surrounded by hundreds of samples, students enrolled in the wool classing course learn to develop skills in selecting the best quality fleece. The course is now in its 30th year and according to teacher and wool expert Bill Montgomery, it's a popular subject. Well, there's people that want to do the course professionally, such as professional wool classes. There's spinners and weavers. There's people that want to um, come in and do the course that want to buy their own property or have their own property, want to know a little more about sheep. We find too quite often that people in general just want to know a little more about sheep and wool and consequently they come in here. figure for that period is down $3 million compared with the same period the year before. Despite sales revenue increasing by 27% over the period, consolidated operating profit is down by 23%. Coal and Allied Management says the figure reflects the drop in demand and prices on the world coal market and what they say is the lack of stability and increased costs since the Coal Industry Tribunal Award of June last year. The company chief general manager Whereas in the Bruce past, Thompson had to stop says he is confident Coal and Allied can overcome have, have the difficult situation unloaded. if the they get cooperation from the workforce and facility. governments. He says that cooperation is essential if the company is to avoid mine closures and retrenchments the in the future. They made on the company and while still enabling.
this boy is sick with leukaemia. Like other cancer patients, he's receiving treatment at the Mater Hospital. Each month, the Prince of Wales oncology team comes to Newcastle and holds a clinic to treat paediatric cancer patients. About 60 children from Newcastle and the Hunter Valley attend the clinic. The Mater Hospital hoped that in between visits, the children would be cared for by Dr Bert Evans, the hospital's liaison paediatrician. But that has not happened. According to Dr Evans, local paediatricians are holding on to their patients. We think if there is a, a local person, local contact person, a local person who can supervise chemotherapy and uh, be responsible for patients locally, this would provide an improved service and uh, provide better care of patients and uh, reduce perhaps the need for children to go to Sydney as well. The system isn't working, is it? Uh, well, it hasn't worked terribly well up to date. We hope that from now on things will improve and that we've had further discussions about how the system might work, looked at a number of practical proposals to try and uh, uh, help things along so that I establish contact with uh, children and their families when they first uh, present here before they go to Sydney and in that way to uh, facilitate you know, you know, the ongoing care that we hope we can provide. Just that paediatricians are trying to hold on to their pain. You look. The Hunter Development, the Hunter Board, Development has Board has sent a letter to Premier, letter to Premier Runsworth calling for him to calling personally, for him to personally in intercede in the dockyard dispute and to meet with a delegation of board members. The, the letter claims that the closure of the yard and confrontation was avoidable. Well, we believe that the only person in the state who currently has the power to be able to finalise this matter as, as urgently as it needs to be finalised is the Premier. What sort of damage do you think this dispute is doing to Newcastle? Well, Newcastle has over the last 10 years built up a very enviable record in industrial relations and that's all being potentially destroyed by one dispute at the dockyard that should never have occurred. Why shouldn't we be addressing our attention then to the unions now on strike instead of the, the politicians? Well, uh, we believe that uh, the unions have always agreed uh, for the need to restructure the dockyard and for there to be... Uh, a change in work practices and for a very large reduction in staff to be made to make it viable and uh, so they've gone as far as they can go as far as we understand in meeting uh, the demands that were necessary. The board believes that the matter could have been handled uh, far more uh, or far better than it has been. The board has also put their support behind the western route for the freeway between Wakefield and Minmai. It says that option disturbs the lease housing, saves coal reserves and is cheaper in terms of construction. Saves coal reserves and is cheaper in terms of construction. The figures compare the number of people who were registered at CES offices in the quarter ending last December with the same period from the previous year. The number of people registered throughout Australia has increased by 13.5%. In New South Wales, an 11% increase was recorded. In the Hunter, however, the figure has decreased by 5.4%. Zone manager for the Department uh, of Employment year, and Industrial Relations, year, Alan Bagwana, says school leavers so tended to register in January this year, year and not before Christmas, which is the usual trend. But he says there has still been a real improvement in the December figure. When you look at the national figure of an increase of about 13.5% 13, 13 and the state figure of 11% to see ours with a minus 5.4, it certainly does give some hope. But again, I don't think we should become too complacent by those figures because uh, seasonal trends can change things and uh, I suppose we live by the theory while there's life there's hope and uh, we hope that that trend will continue to, uh, to be seen. service 
is now operating from its new headquarters in Scott Street. The service is funded by the Department of Housing and two advisers man the phones, taking hundreds of calls a month. If you're unsure of your rights as a tenant the areas of rent, rent leases, leases, eviction, eviction and maintenance, and maintenance then, the then the service will provide, will provide the necessary advice, advice and counselling. counselling. In recent, In recent times, times, the new council area, area has experienced, experienced a, shortage a shortage of rent rental properties, properties, as well as a dramatic rise in rents. And according to Tracy O'Shea, the problems can be traced back to the governments. First of all, the federal government uh, changed the, the taxation laws and they abolished negative gearing and they also brought in capital gains tax on the sale of properties. Now that's caused a lot of landlords who were in the market for profit to leave the market and invest their money elsewhere. I'm not really sure that, that that's a bad thing. Um, the other reason is that the state government has just brought in new legislation that relates to excessive rents. How does the service represent the tenants? Well, what we're trying to do is lobby the state politicians to honour their commitments to bringing in rental reform for tenants to address the virtually ancient 1899 Landlord and Tenant Act and bring it up to modern day standards. And we're involved with a campaign called Campaign for Action for Rental Reform, which is a state-wide lobbying approach to the state government. Even the launch of the Research Foundation's annual appraisal of the Hunter Valley, the booklet This is Newcastle and the Hunter Region, was accompanied by a mention of the trouble at the dockyard. The Lord Mayor, Alderman John McNaughton, was teary-eyed as he spoke of the plight of the retrenched men and of the problem of unemployment in the region. Even though the retrenched men are only a tiny fraction of all workers in the region, he says it is still reason for concern. The Lord Mayor was much happier, though, talking about the booklet he was launching. The booklet has been published annually for 27 years and aims at outlining a variety of statistics and facts for the investor here and from outside. Well, it's aimed at everyone with an interest in the Hunter region and Newcastle, uh, business people and uh, commercial people who wish to make investments in the town, uh, people uh, who want to see just what sort of a workforce we have and so on. It's all the information about Newcastle and the Hunter region. Of course, it's very valuable for school children and teachers as well because it uh, gives an up-to-date perspective of what's happening in Newcastle and the Hunter at the present time. And its predecessors, of course, give a very accurate history of the region. So how important do you see the booklet as being to promoting investment in the Hunter Valley? Oh, very important. It's a, a book that uh, allows an investor to make an informed decision about things and it is the only booklet of its kind in Australia. The Newcastle show is the largest in the Hunter Valley. Each year around 140,000 people pour through the gates over the four days to look at the agricultural, horticultural and arts and crafts displays and to enjoy Sideshow Alley. Traditionally the first day of the show is one of the slowest but pleasant weather today made for a reasonable turnout. The industrial and horticultural displays proved popular with many of the older visitors at the show and the State Rail Authority again won the award for the best trade exhibit. For many of the younger visitors, the popular attractions were Sideshow Alley and the ever popular show bags. This year's Newcastle show boasts record sponsorship of more than $160,000. The organisers say this money has enabled them to put on more than in the past and they're hoping to have another good crowd this year. Well, we, we had a big lift in the early 80s and uh, we've consolidated around about the 130, 40, 50,000 mark and that depends a little bit on the weather. Of course, we've been through some tough times during that period and uh, I think uh, Newcastle's show is a place where Newcastle people can let their hair down and, and perhaps have a bit of fun and entertainment. So are we heading for a record number of uh, record attendance this year? Well, I don't like to, to talk in terms of records. I'd be quite happy to have the same number that we've been having in recent years.
At a special meeting of dockyard union representatives yesterday, the workers prepared their proposal to present before Premier Unsworth. Details of yesterday's meeting in Sydney are being kept under the lid until the union delegation addresses a mass meeting with all dockyard workers later this morning. But last night, Secretary of the Trades Hall Council Peter Barrick said that discussions had lasted for two hours and the workers had been presented with a final counter-proposal by the government. In Newcastle last night, both retrenched and striking dockyard employees staged a picket outside the gates of the state dockyard and the floating dock. They say they're disillusioned at the way the issue has been handled and resent the use of scab labour for security and cleaning staff. Do you think action like this could jeopardise some of the existing jobs already here now? Well, I think the existing jobs are all there to go on, I think, you know. But uh, the situation is, you know, we're just carrying out what we think is a trade union principle, that uh, if uh, people are out on strike and other people come in and do their work, well, then we pick at the gates. We wouldn't have this picket on tonight if uh, Mr Gribble and Mr Knight, within their wisdom last night, didn't call in scab labour. From a bevy of 19 beauties, 23-year-old secretary Patricia Jurd was sashed runner-up in the showgirl quest. But the knight and the crown went to 19-year-old receptionist Lisa Walker. Organisers say because this year's show is offering more than ever before, they're predicting record crowds before the gates close on Sunday. Gavin Jones in a seer from Manly, the current New South Wales and Australian champion. Esprit Light Cooler, sailed by Dennis Tango of St George, the runner-up in both of those championships is another. Perhaps the most interesting vote will be Monty in Newcastle, to be sailed by five times West Australian champion Scott Glaskin, David and Tony Nock from the Mounts Bay Club. In all, eight of the top ten boats in the recent national titles will be in the 32-boat field. Current sprints champion Alan Cummings of Swansea is another favour to do well on home waters. Hotshot Belmont folks, John Millwood, MJH, and David Anstey, Pacific Poker Machine. Leading Port Hunter skiffs of Aaron Gore in Bruce and David Croft of Hornby Plumbing will also be there. Over the weekend, some 40 races will be sailed in front of the club on Belmont Bay, with a grand final listed for 3.30pm on Sunday 
depending on wind conditions. Total prize money for the series is in excess of $7,000, with racing to start at midday tomorrow and 10 a.m. on Sunday. There are significant changes to electorates in the Hunter and Lower North Coast regions. Gloucester electorate will cease to exist and will be incorporated into three new seats, Port Stephens, Myall Lakes and Manning. Port Stephens will take over Stockton from Newcastle and Raymond Terrace from Maitland and part of Mayfield from Waratah. It will terminate at the northern shore of Port Stephens leading into Myall Lakes. That electorate will include Dungog, Stroud and Gloucester and go north to the Manning. The electorate of Maitland will take over Curry from Cessnock and, losing Raymond Terrace, will be made a stronger Labour seat. Cessnock will now incorporate Singleton, Denman, Jerry's Plains and Sandy Hollow, which used to be Upper Hunter. Upper Hunter, in turn, gains Gunnedah from the seat of Castle Ray. Lake Macquarie remains much the same and on the central coast, two new seats come into being, Wyong and the entrance. Coming up from the south, Swansea loses 5,000 voters to Charlestown, which in turn loses parts of Adamstown and Merriweather to Newcastle. However, Charlestown takes New Lambton from Walls End and Gateshead from Swansea. Waratah will take over parts of the Walls End electorate, while Walls End takes some from Cessnock and Lake Macquarie. quickly and the first of those is starting to run up to them now. Well what have we got settled down in front of us now as the black colour is one of the back markers and that of course is Todd Wiltshire. He's run more quickly to the front runners than the other two but here comes Watson. Leading out now the red and white colours of Paul Nielsen but he's going to be overtaken by the back markers very smartly now. There's the white one there, the black and white at least of Warren Taggart. Here comes Wiltshire and Watson on the wall of left on the top of the track. But right out in front now is Paul Nielsen. Todd Wiltshire and Watson, like a Batman and Robin have run to him. Watson going high, Wiltshire low. What's going to happen here now? Watson gets the good line, it's the high line. As Wiltshire was held up and he goes to the front, Chris Watson. Todd Wiltshire chasing him out now. Then Nielsen in third position. They go over the line with one to go. Watson a bike and a half in front of Todd Wiltshire. Then Paul Nielsen. Then the black and white colours of Warren Taggart and you can forget the rest. Look at the race now between Watson and Wiltshire. Two champions. Chris Watson, more experienced, came down on top of Wiltshire. Who's going to get it? Wiltshire! Todd Wiltshire got there. Watson went high. I'm saying he had more experience, Watson. The new garbage collection system uses specially equipped trucks and the new larger wheeled bins. Collection takes place once a week. The council is providing householders with their first new bins, but residents must replace them if they're lost or damaged. Well, to buy 50,000 of them, the council gets a pretty good deal, but if a resident loses one or breaks it by backing the car over it, they can go out and shop around and get one for about $50. Today's committal hearing in Maitland Children's Court before Magistrate Boyd Cleary, six people gave evidence. The court was told that the stepfather of a friend of the accused recognised the knife used in the killing from a news item on NBN. He said it looked like a knife he owned. It was distinguished by a small notch on the blade. The knife was missing when he went to look for it, and he took his stepson to Maitland Police. 
Detective Neville Greenaway told the court that he took a statement from the accused. He says he got the youth to take him and show him what had happened. He claims the youth says he called a taxi from a house in Burley Street in Tanambit. He then went outside and later hailed a cab from the middle of the road. He then left Tanambit in the taxi travelling via Thursby and Metford Streets. He got the taxi to stop after travelling out to Wallalong. According to Detective Greenaway, the youth got out and demanded money. A struggle ensued. According to Greenway, the youth says the taxi driver started throwing punches. He kicked his legs out from under him and the youth fell on top of the driver. The court was told in evidence from uh, Constable Jones, who also used, took a written uh, statement the from the accused, the that he had been holding a knife when he asked for money. And in the struggle, he fell on the driver with a knife. Magistrate Cleary of Maitland Children's Court found that he did have a case to answer on charges of murder and robbery with wounding. He's been committed for trial in Newcastle Supreme Court on March 9. The final rejection of the government's retrenchment on Bennett policy came from a mass meeting of workers this afternoon. Conferences last night with Premier Unsworth brought what the Trades Hall Secretary Peter Barrick described as a concession. But by morning, the government had reiterated its determination to retrench on merit and not seniority. The result? A motion from the floor at today's mass meeting that a strike already nearly two weeks old would continue. It was carried I as one. I can't understand it. Uh, we spent over two and a half hours at a meeting last night. It was uh, nearly quarter to eleven when we came out of that meeting. Uh, we walked out understanding that there had been a shift in the government position. Uh, it had given opportunity for us to get closer together. Uh, it had given an opportunity for the outstanding issues to be put before the Deputy President. Uh, and when we read the public statements today, it seems to contradict all that we understood took place in the meeting. Well, just what was that change in the government stand last night? Well, the change in the government stand was that they deleted uh, certain objectionable words uh, from what they presented to us last week, which in my opinion should have cleared the way for negotiations to proceed. This was dealing with the uh, interpretation of the Oaks report? It was dealing with the interpretation uh, of management prerogative and our, uh, our commitment to seniority. So what happens now? You tell the government they've rejected the proposal? What happens? Well, relay the decision of the mass meeting here today, as I say, was unanimous. Uh, there was no opposition to resolution put up uh, for a continued strike, uh, and that came from the floor. Uh, and I would think that the ball is now on the government's feet. Uh, the Premier's uh, declared his position uh, publicly. Uh, I would assume uh, that he'll proceed to uh, uh, make that public de declaration fact. And the government has stuck to its threat to close down the yard. It called a news conference the in Sydney late this evening, stays, where Mr. Brereton, the Works management, Minister, announced it will be that the dockyard will be exercised on the basis close. of merit and performance, strictly in accordance with. The